not question and not critically engage with the material so that the only students who are actually in, have the skill set to complain about the lack of um, critical theory are actually ones on uh, joint degree programmes. Hey, um, we'll start from this end. If you could speak up to the mic, that would be great. Maybe I'll start with a final question. <laughs> um, it could be that. I mean, it could be that, or it could be that they don't understand the economic models, of course. I mean, you know, both of these are explanations of the data, aren't they? So, um, I, um, I think... Um, I, I, sorry, was that harsh? I don't know. Um, the, um, I think the... Um, I think maybe there's a, a, a problem with this idea of what critical thinking actually means. I think that's, that's, that's the essence of the, of the thing here. Uh, and clearly, there's some people who think that that means questioning the assumptions of particular models that they're being, being taught about, which is, which is fair enough. We do that. Uh, but we probably don't do it in the second year when we're grinding through particular um, models that everyone who is going to go out here and call themselves an economist needs to, needs to learn about it, the, the sort of backbone of the, of the economics program. So maybe we don't do it there. Um, but that's, that doesn't mean that there's no critical thinking going on in those particular kinds of courses, because there's other kinds of critical thinking, which I was, I was trying to link to in my uh, speech earlier. And, and, and that is that you know, learning how to think like an economist is actually learning a form of critical thinking skills. It's learning about how to use a mathematical model, how to apply a model in particular situations, how to understand how the various bits of the model fit together, how the assumptions of the model drive the conclusions that that model uh, comes up with. That is critical thinking. Uh, so, you know, I, don't, I just don't accept the claim that's being made, which is that our modules do not contain critical thinking. Uh, and as, um, you know, we wouldn't be allowed to put the modules on, frankly, uh, if, if, that was, if that was the case. So, um, so yeah, so I, don't, I don't think it's indicative of the problem. Uh, I think there is a problem, there may well be a problem with PPE, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean, I think it may be that the structure of that program is not actually satisfying uh, the students, particularly from the E point of it. I'd, I'd, much, I'd quite like you to do more E uh, and, and less P. <laughs> and other and that's, um, I think you, know, you, you might come away with a better idea of the discipline, a better appreciation of the discipline if that was actually the case. Uh, but obviously, you know, it's PPE you've got, to, you've got to find balance between these things. But that's very much something that you know we, we, we can and try and take forward. Um, complex systems, life sciences, it does sound like a potential university college course. So you know, I think that's um, that's something that, that could be discussed. Uh, there's lots of things that we could do if we have limited resources. So it's just a question of, of, of prioritizing and deciding what's actually going to satisfy um, demands from, uh, from, from students. Um, yes, yeah, so yeah, on the uh, question about uh, the relevance of assumptions, I think you just come back to the point that you know, ultimately the discipline should be empirically based. And when we're thinking about a problem, uh, we think about the realism of the assumptions. What sort of uh, assumptions we, uh, should we postulate in this organization behavior? Do we have them independent? Should they be interacting? Uh, but it's a question of people have horses for courses. What should be, they should be grounded in, in empirical um, reality. Any other question of uh, the use of physics? Because I've been at work with physicists for a, a long time you know, on, on social and economic problems. Uh, and they're very nice, they have very nice conferences. So they, they invited me to a conference in Canberra, which I go to talk, and then repaid them by writing an article with the economists there saying, we're in trends in econophysics, but uh, in econophysics. Uh, but yes, but the physicists did make some, some major empirical advances. Uh, by the year 2000, um, I mentioned the problem of fat tails and the change of asset they <coughs> established beyond doubt there were at least a hundred papers, empirical papers, that showed that financial markets had fat sales in terms of the change in asset prices. And yet this was ignored by all the economists and regulators, and they'd shown it in a real beyond doubt. And they made some other major empirical um, advances. So yes, I think I mean physicists do have a, a, a lot to offer. They're, they're used to formulating models and uh, thinking about problems, and they're also used to solving things empirically. That focus is how do, no, I've got this problem. You know, here's an empirical thing I don't understand. How do I solve it? What model will do it? So they can do a lot of good for economists, but just to just step back just for a minute you know, to, to, to dwell on this, um, I think physicists themselves do need a little bit of socialization. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, economics is a social science. 
You know, and, and so agents in economics, unlike sort of molecules of gas in this room, which you can understand, um, agents in, in, in economics act with some degree of purpose and intent. Um, and I think them all uh, can be a little bit off putting to, uh, to economists uh, because you don't allow for that possibility in general. They need to just sort of uh, incorporate these things. So, for example, Ken said, you know, you learn to think like an economist. I think, yes, a fundamental insight is that you know, agents react to incentives. The net mainstream spoils it by saying they only react in this particular way, uh, rather than just saying it's incentive change, behavior changes. Uh, I think physicists themselves need to meet some way uh, the concerns of economists. Yeah. Victoria? I'd like to pick up the first question um, uh, concerning whether models are, are applied well beyond their intrinsic limits. And you mentioned specifically um, models of household behavior applied to economies as a whole. Um, the most obvious case of that with which we're surrounded all the time is the idea that government can pay down its debt just the way an individual can pay down uh, his or her credit card. Um, of course, if we're paying down a debt on our uh, on our card, we can cut back our expenditure, and that will work. It won't really affect anybody else much. I mean, you know, our local grocer perhaps, but the effects will be quite small. When government does that, the effects are completely different because it's big, uh, and there'll be feedback effects on the rest of the economy. To argue from the household to a large entity like government involves you in what's called the fallacy of composition. That is to say, you're, you're invalidly transferring a proposition from one domain um, where the feedback is not great uh, to another domain where it's very substantial. And the answer turns out to be different when you do that. You, 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 it's not legitimate to move across in, in that kind of way. And the existence of the fallacy of composition is, the, is why we have macroeconomics. Because macroeconomics has all those feedback effects. Um, so I think you know, there are intrinsic limits to the mainstream idea that economics is only about individual behavior. It is about individual behavior, certainly. Not exclusively, um, and there is a, a, a need for that separate discipline of macroeconomics because of the um, importance of feedback relations within the macroeconomy. So it's, it was a very good example that you bring up. As I say, it's all around us, you know, all the time in every political broadcast, uh, and it's important to understand the illegitimacy of making that that shift from the individual to the whole. So thank you for that. End of party political broadcast. I would just pick up on that and take it a step further. That even where we don't have the fallacy of composition at work, even where the models are being applied and what the authors or a proponents of the model would agree is an appropriate thing, there is a terrible problem in the, in the real world, in, 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 in terms of uh, individuals at some point, whether it's policymakers or perhaps the journalists reporting on those, to mistake the model for the reality, the point that Paul uh, mentioned earlier, that, that there is a tendency to regard models as you know, comprehensive explanations, as opposed to simplifying frameworks that illuminate the crucial aspects of that, of that problem. And I think one thing that's very useful as an economist is to continue to remind ourselves uh, that models are like the tube map. It's a, very, a, a simplification of the network. And it's very easy and transparent to understand how to navigate by the by two. But woe well, behold the person who tries to use the tube map to navigate by the by foot. Because I don't know how well you know the tube map, but, but uh, the tube map shows, for example, Queensway Station and his water as being miles apart, not miles, but being significantly <coughs> apart, when in fact they're about 100 meters or you know, less than 100 meters apart, I think, because for the purpose of two navigation, it's very useful to have this clear circle for the circle line, and then to have this schematic representation of the line. So 
in, in models are all that way. The models are, are the whole the theory simplifies. That's what makes it theory. And we, we tend to lose sight of that once we begin to apply them. And particularly once they pass out of our hands, but even sometimes within our hands, uh, into policymakers and journalists, uh, when there's a very strong temptation to treat them as reality as opposed to as a simplifying uh, mechanism. Okay, three more questions. So if we found up here, the floor, we go over there, and uh, Sakir, I'll let you have a go first. So do um, you want to go first? Sir? Sure. Um, I want to start with what I think we all agree on, everybody in here is, is better for us all, better for everybody, that we have cohorts of economics graduates who are coming out fit for this purpose, for the challenges of the 21st world as we have it. So that's not, obviously that's what we're aiming for. Our differences are in what we think that purpose might be, uh, and then the, 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 the preparing them for that. Now, um, I found some of the things very important, but some of them really, really bizarre. I mean, really bizarre. Um, the scale of the need and the challenge as I would perceive it, and I think many people perceive it now, post-crisis, um, <coughs> is such that surely it demands a more appropriate response than, uh, than kind of more of the same. As in, it's a special form of madness to suggest that you know, more of the same is, is going to be appropriate. <coughs> Graduates are not going to want, in however long it takes, they're not going to want to come to a university and rack up enormous debts to learn a religion. <laughs> They're not going to want to do that, but they are going to want to come to a course that they can see has adapted to the 21st world that they can see <coughs> in their very eyes and that can prepare them for things that they would consider productive. So my question is um, whether uh, Manchester whether people genuinely think Manchester, with its current team, is capable of rising to this occasion and pro providing something different from the mainstream that actually uh, is going to attract more students than otherwise it will. Uh, my English is not good, but my question is really simple. Uh, how are we going to achieve growth in a moment of time, when actually we are implementing austerity. I mean, if uh, we keep on uh, implementing austerity, uh, when are we going to see a uh, growth? Uh, what is your opinion about it? Okay, Sophia. Um, I've got two questions, one to the presenters and one to you, maybe. To the well, if anyone from the post christ Society can answer. And since I'm lecturing macro one and macro two, um, uh, I felt obliged to speak really, um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. My students will know I've criticized what I teach myself several times in the, in the lectures explicitly. Um, I would expect some of the presenters, some of the early speakers, to mention about a more perspective about philosophy of science and dominant paradigms and how these paradigms change really, because the whole question of whether or not there will be any heterodox economics being taught in universities depends on whether or not the dominance of that paradigm will be broken. And as we all know, the paradigm feeds itself for obvious reasons, that if you don't publish in A-rated journals, which only publish neoclassical economics, you're not considered to be a good economist. You're not employed by universities. That's what happens when you change your research agenda, for example. I know from personal experience these things. <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask, that's why I would ask one question goes to you, because unless you manage to establish a UK-wide resistance, nothing is going to change. <laughs> I and for obvious reasons, because unless there is this very strong demand, universities at the moment employ lecturers according to how many uh, articles they publish in A-rated journals. And the reason for that is that the money comes according to those publications. 
So it's a vicious cycle that feeds itself, unfortunately. You're asking for heterodox economics to be taught. There is no one to teach them. That is the problem, because those people can't get jobs in universities for the reasons. How, I wonder the, the speaker's opinions about how this vicious cycle is going to be broken. Like, have you, some people have suggested never cite, your, never cite mainstream economists uh -huh. when, you, when you write an heterodox paper. Do you agree with this sort of <laughs> ideas, so that you don't give them extra citations by when in your heterodox <laughs> paper? <laughs> this, this was genuinely suggested, and I think it makes sense. It's not such a stupid idea, basically, because once you write a heterodox paper, you need to criticize the mainstream, so you need to cite them. So the more you cite them, the more citations they get. <laughs> so what's your opinion about how this vicious cycle is going to be broken? Okay, um, I'll come back to myself in a minute. <laughs> well, um, all hard questions, these. Um, I guess I'm more, uh, probably a bit more optimistic than others might be about the prospects for change. Um, I think change happens in, in funny ways. Change happens because of individual, because of agency, uh, and so even single appointments in the department can make a difference in terms of bringing in a new research agenda and influencing how the department develops its program. Um, I think change is happening right now. Uh, in the university environment for two very big reasons. One is uh, that the higher fees are making all of you more vocal about what you want to study. And that's creating, I think, a, a change in dynamic in terms of what is over, over the run of years looking forward going to determine the content of our, our programs. That there is a much stronger um, uh, vote with your feet uh, dynamic that's now been introduced with the high fees. Uh, and I think that is going to lead to change uh, over time. I'd identify another factor, which is I think, uh, and I don't know if my colleagues on the table share this, but I, having been in academics for quite a long time, have the strongest feeling now that I've ever had that the, that the ground is shifting under our feet in terms of online competition and MOOCs and all of that. And I think that's also going to change what we do in terms of our university programs. That you know, if you can now watch lectures from around the world, then a whole bunch of paradigms become available to you in that way. And then you know, that both enhances your ability to be critical in terms of what you're being, uh, you're being offered, but also changes how we think about the nature of the program. You know, going forward, our educations are going to be hybrids of all sorts of things. Right? Students are going to come and make use of this vast array of online information, and we have to decide how we complement that ourselves, you know, as internally, you know, in terms of what we offer face-to-face -face and so forth. But, so I think there are a lot of things at work right now that are going to result in change over time. And that, you know, some of that will no doubt be adverse, but I'm optimistic that some of that actually is going to be positive in terms of opening up education uh, in the way uh, that we would like. Um, if I'm really optimistic, I would say it might even open up uh, um, the field in another way, which is by creating easier access to other disciplinary ways of thinking that that may make it easier for the second year students who at least currently are subjected at LSC, just as at Manchester, to a run of, of, of very dry core theory uh, courses. Um, may get, there may be easier ways to, to, uh, to reform those programs. And uh, one of them is to say that we are going to be much more open to, uh, to sort of short um, sort of injections into the curriculum to make heavy use of online stuff, uh, because relatively that was low staff curriculum on our part, um, but that can really uh, leaven the curriculum with, with new ideas and so forth. Another thing, which is a slightly unrelated thing, is I do think that we can do something about our economic program um, in terms of introducing new things by just reducing the amount of repetition we have. We tend in economics to teach the same thing again and again and again in first year, second year, and third year, just adding a few more mathematical equations as we go along. And I think that's something we can address. And there's this very interesting group called the INET, um, what is it? It's, it's, it's uh, Wendy Connolly's part of it. And Philippe Baguillon, what is it? It's a, it's a curriculum review. Yes. Exactly. And, and that's worth looking into if people are interested in, in the future direction. Because this is a lot of a great group of economists, actually, internationally, 
And one of the things they've said is that, that we should rethink the way in which we structure the undergraduate program because if, if there is space to bring in new ideas if we be, be more realistic about what we actually achieve with this repetition uh, and, and reduce that and reduce uh, the, um, and focus more on what we think are the, the important learning outcomes rather than the usual stable of models that we've thought about. Sorry, that was long ago. <laughs> <laughs> you saved me a lot of trouble. Uh, just once again, I agree with most of that. I, I understand exactly the sensation that, you know, the monoculture has got its claws into every aspect of academic life, and, and, and there's no possibility for change. That's a kind of <coughs> um, feeling that we've all had from time to time. And this is why I'm so excited to be here. Um, because you're saying, no, you haven't got your claws into everything, and in particular, you haven't got your claws into the students, and they're talking to you, and that is terrific. Um, and you're not alone, as you know. There's a, a group in Cambridge. Um, a student came to see me the other day at UCL. Um, and he has now formed his little club. I don't know how well it's going yet, but it's um, I share your, your optimism, um, even while I share also your pessimism. And both things are going on at the same time, and it's a matter of who's going to win. Uh, um, in addition to INET, which stands for the Institute of New Economic Thinking, um, whose website is well worth having a look at, um, there will begin very shortly an online conference on reforming the economics curriculum, um, hosted by what's called the World Economic Association. The World Economic Association grew out of the French protests about the curriculum, the post-artistic economics people. Um, and that the, the World Economic Association is the successor to that. Uh, and I urge you to, to get on the web and find them and join them. And uh, your society can submit something to that conference. Why not? Um, and let's have a, a, a good debate there, which everybody applauded. <coughs> the same student that came to talk to me about the unsatisfactory curriculum and, and what to do about it, had managed to educate himself really rather impressively on his own, on the internet. He's a bright guy, but you know, it takes a lot of initiative. And I was as pleased about the initiative itself, because he wasn't you know, waiting for reading lists that gave page numbers. He was, he was going out there and finding his own stuff. You can all do that. Um, and then you'll be not only agents for change, but agents for informed change. <coughs> Get with it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks, Akia, for letting me have a brief chance to say something. Um, it's great to have a talk with such a great economist next to me. Um, yeah, there was one question that did not get a response. Well, what can we not finish for a moment? Yeah. Well, I'd love to move on to that. Um, yeah, obviously, on the question of UK wide resistance, I would love to see it. Um, I can't really control that. But I think we as a society do want to forge links with as many other institutions as possible. Um, I think you're, yeah, obviously, you have a very pessimistic. Vision. And I think as a society what we really want to do is to keep this discussion going. Like We've got 100 people in this room, we've got people thinking about economics education at Manchester. And I think one thing you'll start to see in universities, as Jonathan Lee mentioned, is as the fees go up, students don't just want to be taught things, they want to have some input into this, they want to know they're getting their money's worth. And so I think you'll hopefully see not just the end of this Emphasis being on the research test exercise, but also on student feedback. And that's something that Manchester cares about a great deal because it's always scores as a university as a whole very low on it. So we start to see that. And so I think from our perspective, yeah, we've got this petition. We want to show that other students want change. Hopefully, people tonight have been convinced by some of the things they've heard and will sign it. And through that, we want to put forward an argument to the economics department that this really needs to happen. And so, therefore, hopefully, they'll do it regardless of the problems that you mentioned. 
and that form of yeah, I mean, the, the INF that uh, Jonathan and uh, Vicky mentioned is, is financed by George Soros, so it is, uh, you know, there's been some very uh, interesting companies. The first one's at Cambridge, so the second one at Bretton Woods. Um, so it's got some real weight behind it. Um, and economists, you know, they, they, I mentioned the idea that you know, agents react to incentives, the economists also react to incentives. Uh, and policymakers felt let down in the crisis, that's very clear. Uh, and so there is, a, you know, there is incentive to actually uh, alter the curriculum. So I think it's very, uh, very um, optimistic. I think just on this question of, you know, when will change happen? Well, the thing, the, the sort of discipline that I'm interested, the things I'm interested in, uh, give an insight to this. Complex systems give an insight into this. In a sense, we might imagine we think we're forming a model. We say we've got a, a, a we've got a population of agents. Um, who can be uh, either in state A or state B. State A means you're a mainstream economist, state B means you ought to change it. Um, and we choose a few people at random to move to state B. How, how far can they persuade people? You know, what's the network structure? And we know most of the time we play set this up on a computer, most of the time it doesn't get very far. Most of the people stay in state A. But every so often we can generate a global cascade with a similar size shock, it will cascade across and people will flee. Uh, the trouble is these things tend to be rather unpredictable, so I'm not going to predict the time, but I think it does look uh, a bit more a bit more propitious uh, than it's done 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 for some time uh, in terms of uh, uh, major reforms to the uh, curriculum. I think there's one point, I think I mean Ken's uh, stuff on, on demand for economists is it's very valuable, it's very 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 useful. Um, but we shouldn't be uh, like bamboozled by this, that there is a, the, the fact that the market for the not market for economists, because the government economic service has been mentioned, 1,500 people, um, and they're the main employer. So whether we regard that as a free market, I'll leave it for the mainstream economic theories to decide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, was there a question about growth? Austerity. Yeah, yeah. I think um, all of us. I'm not macroeconomist, so all of us say is growth will return. Well, after we get emotional behaviour by economics on the books. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question up here, I mean, um, if I um, would paraphrase this, um, when, when will this religious mainstream madness end? Um, I don't, I mean, I, I, because the curriculum is changing all the time. That's, that's the point I was trying to make. The mainstream is actually very broad, very vibrant, very engaged with policymakers, doing a lot of you know, really incredible things at mainstream. So I don't, um, I don't see any reason why <coughs> top departments in the UK are going to move away from, from the mainstream for any, for any particular uh, reason. What I think is going to happen is that the mainstream is going to absorb perhaps some of the ideas that Paul's been talking about, perhaps some of the ideas that Vicky's been talking about, in the way that it absorbs other things, and that the mainstream is going to change in 10 to 15 years' time. Um, macroeconomics will look quite different and so in the way that you know, micro looks different now because of the rise of behavioural economics. So, um, Question. I'll just pick up something uh, Devon um, said uh, that um, you know that he said that um, university departments get their money from doing this um, this research that, that this in the, in the, 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 the top journals there's an incentive to continue to um, do mainstream research and get it published in the, in the, in the top five journals. Well, yeah, actually, we get a relatively small proportion of our income from research and the vast majority actually comes from student fees. <coughs> the ideas that are being put around here that the, the, the student fees matter and what students think matters is, is absolutely right. Um, so if there is a market, if there is a demand, I mean I'm an economist, if there is a demand for this kind of more mainstream economics, then it is profitable for someone to supply it. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 what, that's what we have. Okay, we'll do one more round of questions. Um, we are so we'll keep the, we'll make sure the uh, answers are kept short. Um, okay, so go. So if you have to leave, um, please look at our position on the line and see if you agree with us.
How do you do you think like this is sort of a viable alternative to like having uh, heterodox being taught in universities, or is at least a way of bringing the heterodox in? Um, uh, yeah, I share the men's opinions. First, uh, is I'm trying to know where is this mainstream uh, coming from? Where is this mainstream idea coming from? And um, my idea is to look at uh, who is, yeah, you said who is, who is publishing and who is the money coming from. Is the, all those, the, those um, newspapers are owned by the, the banks, by the, they're owned by the, the same people who are uh, benefiting from this mainstream, uh, mainstream opinion. So that, that's my, my opinion, maybe you can discuss on that. Another point I want to read, sorry. I'm, so, I'm going to have to keep you for a while. I'm sorry I'm going to have to because we just don't have this. It's, it's for you actually. Well, it's very rude to keep people longer than we've been, so it's going to have to be, so everyone goes to one over there. Um, yeah, I have a question for Ken Clark, actually. Um, you pointed to the employment rates of graduates and the success to basically not just the university, but the single honor of economic students. Um, I'm a single honor of economic student. Um, I'm just wondering why you didn't improve the student satisfaction ratings in the same presentation, because we're pretty much on the other end of the scale. Mm -hmm. I understand the practicality of learning. We'll have to keep the answers quite short, so I'll be quite strict. So, do you want to start um, with Jonathan? Hello. Um, I think I'd focus just on, on the first uh, question, which is what the broad is of changing the dynamic here. Uh, and just to make a sort of quite quick observation that how the internet is affecting both uh, our discipline but also more broadly uh, intellectual discourse is a tricky thing because, uh, on the one hand, um, we now have access to this very broad range of opinions and information and so forth. So you might say that the internet is opening up discourse internationally. And you can find examples where that's happening, and, and there are examples of where you know, isolated uh, bloggers end up having uh, influence on, on uh, uh, significant institutions, and examples like the one you mentioned. But there's a funny thing about the internet, which is that it turns out to be very... Uh, much affected by homophily, that is our, our tendency to want to find people <coughs> like us. And that what we see being created on the internet are this series of, of echo chambers where people actually listen more and more to people like them. That is, through Facebook and, and other mechanisms, we're able now to identify people who have similar views and, and preferences to our own and listen increasingly to them. Now, the, the UK, which continues to have a national broadcaster, isn't been affected quite as badly as the US. But you know, if you look at political discourse in the US, there are people who, from the moment they begin to become politically aware, listen only to Fox News and other conservative channels on one hand, say, and listen on Facebook to their group of friends, wherever they might be, or alternatively, MSNBC or whatever. You know, so, so that the internet seems to be uh, actually segregating people and creating these echo chambers that may actually mean that ideas don't travel as much as they did when we had these official gateways that gave access to ideas to lots of people, whether that gateway was a newspaper or a national broadcasting uh, company or whatever. So I think, I think it's a tricky thing to understand how, how the internet is affecting both our discipline but intellectual.